Cars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Calling all cars. Attention all cars to broadcast 246 regarding a robbery. Be on the lookout for Roy Gardner, described as 5 feet 10 or 11 inches, 165 pounds. Red hair, brown eyes, heavily speckled hands. This man is wanted in connection with the holdup of a mail truck in San Diego. That's all. Practical endorsement of Rio Grande crack by the men who drive their police cars, fire engines, and ambulances is the highest recommendation ever given a gasoline in endorsement. Eagerly sought by many, voluntarily given to one, Rio Grande crack. For the humorous brand to choose from, a predominant number of your city, county, California, state, and federal government heads gave this better gasoline the call until today, more vitally important emergency automotive equipment is powered by Rio Grande crack wherever it is sold than any other brand. Equally significant is the continued loyalty of tens of thousands of individual motors, like yourself, to this maximum power. Quicker on the takeoff, more miles in the tank full gasoline. Rio Grande appreciates your patronage, commends your good judgment, and says to those who have yet to experience real honest to goodness police car performance, begin getting yours tomorrow by dropping around at the nearest red and white station and filling up with Rio Grande crack, the most favored public saving gasoline in the West. our usual custom tonight and have asked Chief of Police James E. Davis of Los Angeles to introduce our speaker. Ordinarily, the cases which are heard on calling all cars are taken from the files of police departments or sheriff's offices where the crime has occurred. Tonight, however, our story comes from the memory of a man who spent 17 years behind prison bars, learning most conclusively that crime does not pay. I wish to introduce Mr. Roy Gardner. Thank you, Chief Davis. My purpose in coming here tonight is to bear witness to the statement the chief just made regarding the unprofitableness of a life of crime. I have, during my career, faced prison sentences totaling 75 years. And in all my escapades, I received less than $1,000. A man who is mentally able to analyze his problems never gets into prison. It's not smart to commit a crime. It's just plain ignorance. Police officers are trained to analyze all the angles of crime, and they are men of superior intelligence. I have served time in San Quentin, Leavenworth, Atlanta, and Alcatraz, and I know what I'm talking about when I say that the most trying time of a man's life is when he is attempting to beat the law. I spent 17 years learning that crime does not pay. Nineteen oh nine, a hot July sun blazed down on the Mexican desert as a groaning wagon creeped along the sandy road. Get along there, mules. I gotta make camp before sundown. Go on, get up. What's the matter with you, crazy mules? Uh oh, soldier. Senor, why are you carrying your wagon? Why, amigos, I'm surprised you don't know me. There are guns in my wagon. Ah, is that so, senor? And who are the guns for? They're for General De La Huerta. Is that so? Americanos should know that the government does not need guns. But I tell you that... You are telling me nothing, senor. Get down off that wagon. The soldiers will escort you to Hermosillo. Roy Gardner was taken to the regional headquarters of Hermosillo, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. He was thrown into a stagnant, rat-infested cell with three other Americans. This will be your home, senor, for the next week. Yeah? Then what? Then, my friend, we will shoot you. And the three dogs who are your cellmates, too. Hot. Sit down and cool off, hothead. Who are you? I'm Doc Campbell. That's Jim Bruce in the top bunk asleep. That other fellas are all right. You can see them when your eyes get a little more accustomed to the gloomy condition of our living room. What are you fellows doing here? We tried to run a few guns. Yeah, me too. But I get out in a week. Is that so? Oh, that's good. Nah, it's bad. I get shot. Congratulations. So do we. Well, why don't you get out of this mud pie jail? What's the use? We haven't anywhere to go. Besides, it's hot outside. 
Hey, what are you fumbling with that door for? Have you taken a look at this door lately? Lots of times. Look, this wood is old and crumbling. Well, we can cut our way out of here in no time. What about the guards? Oh, I can handle them. Are you with me? Sure. What about the other two? They'll come all right. But uh, what are you going to use to cut the wood? My belt buckle. <laughs> God gets close, we smash it the rest of the way. See? Yeah. After that, it's up to us. You ready? Yeah. Ready? We're ready. Okay, here he comes. Now, <laughs> oh, that's got him. Come on. There's another guard around the corner. You better grab that guy's rifle and cartridges. We'll need him. Yeah. Hold it. I think that guy's asleep. <laughs> yeah, that did it. Here, let me divide these guns. Now, we're going to have to split up. Yeah. Who wants to go with me? I'll go. Okay, let's scram. Huh? Thus, for the first and last time, Lloyd Gardner had a partner in his just with death. A full week later, he staggered across the border of Naco, Arizona, delirious, emaciated, crazed with thirst. Our scene shifts now to Christmas Eve in 1910 on crowded Market Street in San Francisco. Let me see some of those diamonds that you've got in that tray there, the unmounted ones. It would be a pleasure. About what size stone are you looking for? It doesn't matter. I'll take them off. No, you don't. Put those diamonds down. Stop that man. Stop, please. Stop. In spite of the fact that the property which you stole was recovered in its entirety and you did not profit to any extent from your crime, there was nevertheless an intent to commit a felony. And you did, as a matter of fact, commit this felony. Therefore, I sentence you to San Quentin Penitentiary for a term of not less than one, nor more than ten years. It is June 1912 in San Quentin Prison. Murphy! Hey, Murphy! Get your rifle to help Callahan out of that north gate! Wait! Tell the guards in the south, tell the block, turn the water on. Oh, Run! Get out of here before I shoot you! Come on! Get back to yourself! Oh, there you go. I'm going to take this precious captain of the garden straight on up. Drop the gun cover. Hey, you can't get away with this, Spike. You guys haven't got a chance. Oh, that's it, Joe. You keep out of this gun and we'll slug you. Come on, cover, get started. Oh, you crazy trap. They'll shoot you in the minute to step out that door. Oh, no, they won't. I can't get in front of me. Don't do it, Spike. I tell you to keep out of this gun. Stupid. All right, you guys. I've got the gun now. Get back, all of you. You're all friends of mine, and I'm not going to stand by and see you commit murder. This kind of stuff won't get you anywhere. Good work, Gardner. I'll take over now. I got the bracelets on Spike. She hurt? No, not bad. Just a goose egg on his jaw. How about you? Where'd he shoot you? Bob. Bobby. Bobby all For that strange quirk of heroism, Gardner was granted a parole with only half his term served. So from 1915 to 1920, Roy Gardner was a model citizen. Meantime, he had married, become a father, and had settled down to routine of business. Then he decided to take a vacation. Eighteen years have passed since then, and Roy Gardner never came home again. He does not know himself how the debacle started. He does recall wandering about Tijuana in an alcoholic daze. He awoke in San Diego 24 hours later with a throbbing head and an empty pocketbook and a sudden consuming rage. In that swift transition, Roy Gardner, successful businessman, became Gardner the Bandit. On the afternoon of April 27th, Roy Gardner stood near the registry window of the San Diego post office. He saw a bank clerk deposit two heavy packages. He heard the messenger say... Here's $50,000, Joe. It's got to be in Los Angeles tonight. Just before train time, Roy Gardner slipped into a dark alley behind the post office and finally located the truck carrying the registered mail. He waited until it crawled slowly through the alley and made a flying leap for the rear end and hung on as it sped down the dimly lit street. Pull over to the curb, buddy. Now listen, stranger, Never I... mind that talk. This isn't a cap pistol in your back. Pull over. Now, which of these sacks holds the registered stuff? I don't know, mister. I don't know what they gave me tonight. Oh, you don't, eh? Buddy, I'll give you just about two seconds to tell me. If you don't, I'm going to plug you and throw you off the truck and take the whole works. All right. It's in the four sacks you're standing on. Now you're talking, buddy. I'll just rip them open and take what's in them. you get a nice fancy wrap for this, fella. Well, don't let it worry you, mister. <laughs> Back in his cheap hotel room, Gardner found his ball had netted him $67,000. 
with the money, he fled northward to Del Mar, found an isolated field near the town, and buried the money. Meanwhile, back in San Diego, the keeper of the hotel was looking over mud pictures in the San Diego police station. Yeah, that's the man right there. Uh, uh, that's the fellow who stayed at my place two days, and then he didn't show up anymore. And, and he left the day the mail truck was held up. Uh, and there's his suitcase right there. It's got his name on it, R. Gardner. And, and here are the mail sacks I found in his room after he left. That's the man, all right. One thing Gardner did not know when he held up the truck was that the numbers of all the bills in that shipment were registered and known to authorities. Consequently, he was easily traced to his nearby hideout, captured and brought before the United States District Judge. Roy Gardner, you have been charged with the crime of robbing the United States mail. The evidence has been presented. It points indubitably to your guilt. In view of this evidence, you have pleaded guilty. And in consideration of your prison record, I hereby sentence you to serve a period of 25 years in McNeil Island Federal, Federal Penitentiary. Well, Kavanaugh, how do you like this scenery? I like it all right. How about you, Egg? It's okay. Hey, where are all those deer we were supposed to see up here in Oregon? Oh, they'll come along. You know, I'd think you guys would be a little worried about me getting away. Why should we? You're pretty well handcuffed and tied up. And it's a cinch you're not going to jump off the train that way. Tell me something, Gardner. What's the big idea of pulling tricks like you did? Oh, I don't know. I just decided on the spur of the moment that I was going to take that money. Yeah? Who'd you have helping you? Nobody. What was the idea of burying the gun with the money? I didn't want to run the risk of hurting anybody. <laughs> I'll bet that truck driver would have been glad to know that. Take my advice, Gardner. Next time you rob the mail, don't steal bank shipments. The serial numbers are always registered. I found that out. Say, look at that big deer out there in the meadow. Deer? Yeah? Where? Uh, let okay, me see. gentlemen, it's my turn for a while. Huh? Take your keys, Mr. Cavanaugh, and get these bracelets off my wrist. What's this? You better do it. He's got my gun. Make a snappy, Cavanaugh. You're making a big mistake, Roy. Yeah, it was 25 years to do. You've got to do it sometime. Well, maybe so, but not now. Now, we'll just put these cuffs on you two, gentlemen. Now, Mr. Cavanaugh, I'll take your gun and your money. I'll need traveling expenses, you know. You'll regret this, Gardner. Oh, I don't think so. Well, looks like we're coming into Portland. I'll be seeing you, gentlemen. So long, Cavanaugh. Give my regards to the warden. In the days that followed, Gardner moved like a man in a nameless marathon, plodding, gasping, his ears throbbing to the tread of pursuing feet. He stole a motorboat at Rainier and shot down the Columbia to Astoria, where the sea swallows the river's rush. He took a train to Tacoma, Seattle, and Bellingham. He stole a car and fled across the Canadian border. He boarded a Canadian Pacific train at an obscure station and debarked in distant Saskatchewan and finally, bearded and red-eyed, he reached Minneapolis. For months, he led a charmed life. Then the haunting memory of his wife and child dulled his wits and there was born a nostalgia that could not cope with caution. And in spite of the ring of armed men assigned to keep an eye on his wife's residence, Gardner took the 50 to one chance and slipped through and somewhere the two left. Then with the pack at his heels, Gardner fled. Southern Pacific, number 20, rolled slowly out of Roseville, California Yards, headed eastward on the long run to Chicago. Hey, what are you doing in here? This is a mail car. You're telling me. Get your hands up while I blow your head off. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, don't you. Now, turn around and drop your hand behind you. Uh, yes, sir. You're getting that strap too tight. Save the talk. Where's the registered mail? Uh, I don't know. Quit stalling. Honest, I don't know. I'm just deadheading this run tonight. Okay, I'll find out for myself. You better be careful. You're going to ruin some mail the way you're cutting those sacks. That's tough. There she is. Now, I'll just take what you've got in your pocket and be on my way. How do you stop this train? I'm not sure. It's either two or three pulls on the signal call. What are you trying to do? Double cross me? I'll try the emergency. Just keep your back turned, buddy, and you won't get hurt. Roy Gardner was not fated to profit from that robbery. Next morning, a quickly formed posse found the stolen mail pouch with its $175,000 intact. Gardner had kicked it off the train and had lost it in the darkness. On the evening of May 23rd, eight days after the robbery, Chief Special Agent O'Connell and his assistant, George Locke, made a startling discovery. Hey, O'Connell. Do you see what I see? I don't know. What is it? See that fellow going into that gambling joint down there in the middle of the block? Yeah, I've seen that guy before. I'll say you have. That's Roy Gardner. Come on, let's go down there. Are we going to try and take him ourselves? No, there's Austin and McShane just coming out of that restaurant over there. We'll call them over. Hey, McShane. 
Come over here a minute. Well, between you and me and the gatepost, I'm just a little nervous about taking this guy. No, I don't think he'll blast us. He hasn't shot anybody yet. What's on your mind, O'Connell? Well, we just saw Roy Gardner going into a gambling joint a couple of doors down the street. Locke and I are going to take him. You and Austin want to come along? Sure. Come on over, Austin. You keep on the job outside, and if he starts out, let him have it. And be ready to shoot. Work, boys. A couple more hands like that, and I'll be sitting pretty. Don't move, Gardner. Hey, what's coming off here? We're raising your ante. We're going to call you. Get on your feet and don't make any false moves. Or you're going to get hurt. Okay, partner. You don't have to jam that gun in my neck so hard. <laughs> Roy Gardner was placed aboard a train that night and taken to San Francisco, where a week later, before federal judge Van Fleet, the unpredictable outlaw, pleaded guilty and was given another 25-year sentence on McNeil Island. Loaded down with an Oregon boot and fairly clanking with chains, Gardner started his northward journey in the company of Deputy United States Marshals Thomas Mulhall and D.W. Lincoln. Look, Mulhall, these handcuffs are too tight. So what? I want them tight. Someday I'm going to blast you. That's what all you guys say. Well, you're not pulling with a kid now, Mulho. I've got 50 years staring me in the face. And if you think I'm going to do it, you're nuts. What are you going to do about it? If I get my wrist out of these handcuffs, I'll show you what I'll do. Yeah, but you're not going to get your wrist out of those handcuffs. Okay, skip it. What time is it? It's 7.30. What do you care? You're not going anywhere. Maybe not. You've got nerve enough to let me. I'd like to wash my hands and go to bed. Okay. Go ahead. But leave the door open. Okay, smart guy, get to mid Where'd you get that gun? Wouldn't you like to know? You won't get away with it. Ah, this. that's what they all say. Get over there and get these handcuffs off. And you, Wrinkle, keep your mouth shut and don't you make any funny moves. Now, Mr. Mulhall, I'll take your gun if you don't mind. Uh, now stay right where you are, Wrinkle. Stop your gun on the floor. That's fine. Now pick it up and hand it to me, Mulhall. Yeah. By the barrel, wise guy. All right. Okay. Get these cuffs off. Yeah. Now, we'll put them on you and your silent friend there. Right. You don't suppose he's scared, do you, Mulhall? No. Now, we'll just equip our Mr. Mulhall with this Oregon boot. I ought to kick your teeth out. And I'll borrow your wallet like this yeah. and be on the way. Incidentally, copper, I never intended to shoot you anyway. That's big of you, Gardner. If I'd have been in your place, I'd have shot you down like a dog. Well, so long, coppers. Give my regards to the wood. In San Francisco, investigation was immediately launched to learn how Gardner had smuggled the gun aboard the train. It was found that he had been searched three times, and to this day, no one knows how he accomplished that sleight of hand trick. The news of his escape was flashed over telegraph wires, and the entire Pacific Northwest was turned overnight into a vast hunting ground. Gardner's movement for the next 48 hours were the hysterical antics of an animal in a trap. Finally, taking a gamble through sheer desperation, he swung aboard an outgoing freight train near Castle Rock. At last, street Centralia, Washington, made his way to a small hotel, registered as Dale Patton. But again, a suspicious innkeeper was his downfall. Well, what is it? Your name Patton? Sure, why? Oh, nothing in particular. Just wanted to talk to you a minute. Sure, it's tough to have your face wrapped up like that. Yeah, it'll be all right in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. What happened? Oh, some gasoline exploded in the machine shop where I was working. You're pretty lucky it didn't get in your eyes and hair. Huh? Oh, yeah. It would have been pretty bad if I hadn't been wearing a cap and goggles. The landlady thought you might be hiding something. What do you mean by that? Oh, she thought you might have smallpox or something. Oh, yeah? As a matter of fact, those bandages don't look right to me. Well, since when have coppers got the right to bother a working man just because his face don't look right? I can prove who I am and where I got these bandages and why I'm wearing them. Now, beat it before I call the manager. Did you say copper? You heard me. Mister, I was going to take you down to headquarters, but I've changed my mind now. I'm going to take a look at you right here. I don't like the looks of those freckles on your fingers. Now, just get your hands up. Don't make any funny moves for any guns. What are you going to do? I'm going to take those trick bandages off your face. Like this. Hey, take it easy. And this. And this. Ah, ah, that's just what I expected. Let me see your arm. A spread eagle tattoo mark, huh? Come on, Gardner, I'm taking you in. Okay, cop. I'm it. (laughs) 
Thus, after long months of matching wits with the law, Roy Gardner reached that cold, windswept St. Helena, McNeil Island. Gardner quickly swung into prison routine, friendly, anxious to make the best of his lifetime jolt. But the cloak of good behavior was only a thin mantle to shield his plotting mind. Eighty-one days after the gate to McNeil Island, prison had swung closed on Gardner. We find him again, planning to escape. Hey, Bogart, you ready? Sure, I'm ready. Where's Impen? He's over there by the fence. Did you bring the pliers? Yeah, come on. Hey, Impen, are you still ready to go? Sure, what have we got to lose? We're lifers, ain't we? If we get shot, we get shot. Any way you look at it, we die in here. Okay. And you two guys stand close together so they can't see me while I cut this wire. Yeah. Hurry up, Gardner. Hurry up, hurry up. Take it easy, fella. You've been here a long time. You're used to this dump. Make it snappy. Okay, there she is. You ready? Ready. Let's go. Hey, Gardner, where do you think you're going? Hey, come back here, you guys. Great! 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 Come on, boys. Okay. I'm going to do my shooting until we get the other guys rounded up. Oh! Thank God, Keep going, Keep going, Keep going. Still want to break? Sure, go on. I got you. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Four hours later, as the gathering darkness swept over McNeil Island, guards toured the thickets with searchlights, but found no trace of the missing Gardner. The search was finally abandoned. Gardner had escaped again. Under a pall of roaring smoke from a fire started to rout him out of hiding, Gardner had crept back through the hole in the fence and for six interminable days lay hidden in the loft of the prison barn. Then one night as the fog swirled and eddied across the bleak island, Gardner made his halting way to the coast, plunging into the icy water, Puget Sound, drifted with the tide toward the mainland two miles away. Then one morning in the office of the San Francisco Bulletin, the managing editor received a letter. Hey, Bill, come here a minute. Okay, just a minute. Don't give me any of that just-a-minute stuff. Get over here. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. After all, we had to get that story out on that movie dame that just hit yeah, down. the devil with that. Take a listen to this letter I just got. It's from Roy Gardner. Oh, now, look, boss. You're old enough not to fall for such things as that. Shut up and listen. Oh, give me a cigarette. I said shut up. You think it'd kill you to do without one of those things for ten minutes? Now, here's Gardner's letter. I got shot in each leg before I got to the thicket. I was pretty dizzy and weak from loss of blood, so I crawled under a thick bush behind the fence and covered myself up with leaves. Just a babe in the woods, huh? I stayed there till long after midnight. I could hear the guards beating the brush all around me. When they moved away to another part of the island, I crossed the field to the prison farm barn. I dragged myself up into the haystack and stayed there the rest of the night. Well, didn't even wait until the cows came home. Oh, shut up. I was desperate to get off McNeil, and I figured I would have to swim across to Fox Island. Believe me, I wouldn't do it again. It is the toughest swim I ever had in my life. I was nearly unconscious by the time I got across. Yeah, if he'd been conscious, he wouldn't have tried it in the first place. Oh, now, look, Bill, will you keep quiet? I crawled along the shore, found another barn, and fell asleep there. I stayed on Fox Island for four days, milking cows and eating apples. And then I finally got across to the mainland where a friend of mine took care of me till the wounds in my legs were better. Who's the friend? That's what we'd like to know. Listen to the rest of the letter. I want you to tell my wife not to worry about me and to tell her that I'm through with crime. I also want to tell the world that I'll make good if they'll only give me a chance. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> a good husky haul out of a mail car. Well, he's enclosed a letter here to the president asking for a chance to go straight. He doesn't want a pardon, he says, just a suspended sentence. Yeah, I bet he does it that well, what do you want me to do about this? Slap this thing on the front page. Give it everything you got. As soon as the copy desk gets a head on it, let me see it. I'm going to get me a job in a nice, quiet boiler factory. Roy Gardner came out of his hole in November. He turned up in Maricopa, Arizona, a disheveled, haunted figure who had grown a beard and dyed his hair in a frantic effort to disguise himself. Just before train time in the post office at Maricopa, a figure loomed in the doorway. Hey, hey, you can't come in here. This is a post office sorting room. You ain't got any business in here. That's what you think, buddy. Reach for the ceiling and keep your mitts up. Uh, uh, what do you want? This is a hold-up, mister. I want the registered mail and I want it quick. Uh, it's gone to the depot. Oh, no, it hasn't. There won't be a train out of here till morning. Come on, fella, give. Where are those registered pouches? Uh, yeah, over there by the door. All right. Put your hands behind you. And we'll just tie you up with one of these nice, heavy cords hey, here. Hey, And I'll take your gun. That's just in case. Now, if you're a smart boy, you'll keep your mouth shut till I get out of here. Mm-hmm. 
Gardner scuttled out of Maricopa before a posse could be organized, crossed the Gila River and sought a haven, a little hotel in Phoenix. Perhaps the momentary security dulled the sharpness of his wits. Perhaps he lost sight of the irrefutable law of averages, for he decided to perpetrate another crime in Phoenix. The plan took shape in his mind on the afternoon of November 15th when he overheard a conversation in a baggage car. Where's that shipment you got to Los Angeles? Keep your shirt on, Dutch. It's right here in these little sacks. Oh? 15,000 in cash. All right, that is good. Hurry it along. The train leaves in just a few minutes. Okay. Here they come. Catch them. <laughs> All right. Throw the other one. Here she comes. <laughs> All right. Uh, give me the book. I'll sign it. Okay, Dutch. See you next week. Yeah, I'll be back. Who's there? All right, monkey, get your hands up. Who are you calling monkey? I'm talking to you, squarehead. Get your hands up. No, I will not do it. Where's your gun? It is in my locker. What's the matter with you? Do you want to get shot? No, but I will not be held up. Yeah, that's what you think. Now get back there. No. I said get back there. No, you do not hold me up. That's what you said, pal. Go on, get back over there. Don't push. You're the bullheadedest guy I ever saw in my life. I said don't push. I am not cattle. No? Well, how do you like this? Uh now you have done it. Now I teach you a lesson. I teach you what happens to guys who monkey with the me. Oh, yeah. You take a swing at me, you square head. I'll get you back. Yeah. You hey. find out. Hey, hey no. I'm scared of you. In here. Hey, come yeah, quick. Please. Bring a rope. Oh. I have got a bandage. Huh? <sighs> Boy, I'll say you have. You know who that guy uh, is? No. He's just a big fool. Think he could hold me up. That's Roy Gardner, the male bandit. Who? Roy Gardner. Yeah? From now on, he's just a number in a prison cell. Push me like a cat in the doom cup. In just a moment, Chief Davis will give us concluding facts regarding our program. But first, just a reminder. The right and left bower of the most efficient motoring are those two Rio Grande products, Rio Grande Craft the superior gasoline of police car performance, and Rio Lube, the motor oil that can't break down at any heat at any speed, the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. And now Chief Davis. In spite of efforts to save him, the evidence against Gardner was so conclusive that he again pleaded guilty and received the third 25-year term. Chained and watched like a mad dog, Gardner was taken to Fort Leavenworth. Late in June of this year, Roy Gardner was released after 17 years in prison. An outstanding example of the losing nature of a life of crime. Thank you, Chief Davis. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 246 regarding a robbery. Suspects in this case have served his sentence. That's all. Rose and quit. Gardner in tonight's broadcast was played by Mel Ruick. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night.